All right, hello you lucky people. Here we are on the first video lesson related to Unit 6. We're going to be talking a lot about the Civil War itself during this unit. I know you guys have spent some time, uh, most of you have spent some time, uh, going through the textbook and reading about things like uh, the Compromise of 1850. You guys have read a little bit about the changing sentiment towards slavery. Uh, things like Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, by Harriet Beecher Stowe. That book sells uh, a lot of copies in the United States. It, it makes abolition, uh, the idea of you know freeing people, freeing humans from bondage, it makes abolition um, a much more talked about and accepted way of thinking. Although you have to remember, uh, in the United States during this time, and we're going to see this today um, in our discussion about Lincoln Douglas, you're going to see that most people in the North don't have an opinion on slavery one way or another. Um, some see it as evil. Some see it as just a way of life. Uh, very, very few people are talking about anything uh, resembling you know, the idea of African Americans uh, freed slaves having equal civil rights with white people. Um, that's an unheard of idea, only embraced by a small percentage of abolitionists. And those abolitionists are going to be located pretty much up in New England, uh, along the northeast coast of the United States, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Well, I want to start our story today with Stephen Douglas. Uh, he's going to be a Democrat from Illinois, although he was originally born in Vermont. Uh, he's going to come to Illinois in the 1830s, and he's going to run in some of the same circles of Abraham Lincoln. Um, they're going to be rivals, in fact. Uh, so much that uh, Mary Todd and Stephen Douglas are going to date for a while. Well, we know how that story ends. She'll eventually start dating Abraham Lincoln, and they will get married. So Douglas is a little bit more successful uh, politically, though, than Abraham Lincoln. Remember, Abraham Lincoln went to the House of Representatives there during the Mexican-American War as a Whig. He spoke out in opposition to the war. Following his term in the House of Representatives, Abraham Lincoln uh, had moved back to Illinois, where he became an even more successful lawyer than he'd been before he'd left. Uh, Stephen Douglas, though, is going to be a senator, like we said, a Democrat from Illinois, and he is going to get into a little bit of a bargain-making deal here with the South. Politics is often seen as being successful uh, when there are compromises. You know, we hear that word a lot. Um, the idea, you know, you give a little, uh, you take a little, and everybody ends up getting what they want. In you know, we, we kind of rate things on their importance and and. A lot of tough decisions to be made. Well, all that being said is that Stephen Douglas wants a transcontinental railroad to be built. Um, everybody's talking about a transcontinental railroad. The idea of manifest destiny from sea to shining sea. Well, here around 1854, Douglas is going to get what's called the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. Basically, uh, Illinois gets to play a key role in the Transcontinental Railroad, but the southern states are only going to support it if we can get in the idea of popular sovereignty. Um, if we recall, popular sovereignty means when people can vote for a particular issue, or like people can vote for a decision uh, rather than their elected representatives. Uh, and the, popular, the issue of popular sovereignty here in the Kansas-Nebraska Act is whether or not Kansas will be slave or free. Uh, so this compromise is going to inadvertently touch off uh, what becomes known as bleeding Kansas. Uh, the issue of Kansas is going to weigh heavily upon people's minds regarding the issue of slavery in the 1850s. Um, you're going to have the idea of border ruffians. These are going to be pro-slavery people, generally from Missouri. Well, they're going to jump across the border and they're going to vote illegally. On the flip side of this, you also have these people that are called radical abolitionists and others known as free soilers. These people are going to arrive from the east, and it sort of has that Wild West mentality where different families and different factions, whether they be pro-slavery or anti-slavery, are going to stake out claims, and they're going to open uh, you know, businesses and farms and everything else. Uh, well, these border ruffians that are heading across... We can kind of all infer what's happening here by this political cartoon from the Kansas Territory in 1855. We have a whole line of border ruffians lining up at the polls, and then we see a sign there at the bottom down with the abolitionists. And then the line reforms over here at the whiskey stand. So votes are being bought for a lot of different reasons there. Well, John Brown uh, is a really interesting character in American history. Uh, we call him a radical abolitionist. 
Um, his, you know, the idea of his radical nature today is that he wanted to see African Americans freed. He wanted to free um, slaves, and and well, we're going to talk a little bit more about what John Brown does here in a bit. But let's understand that. John Brown is probably a little bit more under our terms of understanding what slavery is about here in the eight, in, in, in 2020. There are going to be a lot of war crimes that are going to be committed uh, during this time period. A lot of people that are going to be, uh, a lot of prisoners end up getting massacred. Uh, it's going to be kind of a guerrilla warfare sort of thing. Well, you've got war crimes and, and you've got this issue that happens in in. Lawrence, Kansas here during the Civil War uh, by these guys called Quantrill's Raiders. Uh, This is going to be a location of, uh, you know, this this guerrilla war that goes on between the pro and anti-slavery forces. That's going to go on before, during, and after the Civil War. James Buchanan, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, is going to wind up getting the Democratic nomination for president here in 1856. Uh, That's kind of surprising because the incumbent was a Democrat by the name of Franklin Pierce. But Franklin Pierce wasn't a very popular person. After receiving the nomination from the Democratic Party, James Buchanan is going to run against a a Republican presidential candidate, uh, a guy by the name of John Charles Fremont. John Charles Fremont had a very storied history in California before and during the Mexican-American War. Uh, he's this guy that plays life by his own set of rules, and there in 1856, uh, Fremont is going to be nominated by this new party uh, from the North called the Republicans. The one thing they have to remember about the Republican Party is that it's going to be made up of a lot of people who are anti-slavery, or at least anti-expansion of slavery. Uh, Charles Free John Fremont is one of these people in history. If you, you get a chance to read more about him, he he's kind of like a Hamilton, uh, in the sense that he's one of these people that's everywhere at every event, and uh, he, he really deserves like his own biopic or something. But so the election of 1856 winds up basically being a Democratic victory. Uh, you can see they won 174 electoral votes, while the Republicans only captured 114. Uh, popular vote-wise, 1.8 million to 1.3 million. Uh, there's this group there in Maryland called the American Know Nothings. Uh, these are like kind of Whigs, but not really. These people are anti-immigrant. In fact, there's a strong anti-immigrant sentiment during this time that we would almost, well, we have to kind of find ironic and laughable today. It's basically, it's concern about the rising number of Irish and German immigrants into the United States. Now, most of these Irish and German immigrants are settling in the North, although there are a few uh, Irish communities and, and a lot of other immigrants that will be settling in the South you know, right up until the Civil War. Um, there's a concern about how the country is shaping up, whether it's the expansion and, and growth of slavery in the South, uh, as it you know, is debated about spreading into the West, uh, the, the issue of, of industrialization, you know, there's more urbanization, there are more factories in the north. Railroads are dramatically changing, you know, people's understanding of, of what it means to get from point A to point B, and it's also changing people's uh, perspective of time. There's a book by a American historian named Kenneth Stamp, and it's called uh, America in 1857, A Nation on the Brink. And this book is going to look at the year of 1857 and how this sort of makes the American Civil War um, almost an inevitable thing. I mean, there's still a lot of choices to be made by individuals and states and governing bodies. But by 1857, we start to see some significant cracks in the foundation of the United States of holding it all together. So James Buchanan's performance uh, during this time period in in the first months of the Civil War is going to earn him, uh, perhaps fairly or unfairly, uh, the title of being one of the worst presidents in American history. James Buchanan, though, is at the helm of the ship uh, when his own political party is going to start to split up. Uh, The Democrats are going to basically become uh, either pro-slave Southerners or anti-slave Northerners. And the Republican Party that had ran Fremont there in the 1856 election, well, that's actually just going to grow and grow and grow. In fact, they're going to get a lot of Whigs who are done with the whole Whig party. They're going to capture a lot of people that are, are 
worried about the expansion of slavery. So the Republican Party is going to grow pretty dramatically. Speaking of evolution and change, we have some pretty fascinating pictures of the Capitol building of the United States here where Congress meets the House of Representatives in the Senate. Uh, we've got a great book sale going on there to our left. Old photographs are cool because in the middle of this picture in the frame, you can see the shadow of a wagon, uh, so a, a buggy or whatever that is moving down the street. Or it's, it also appears transparent because you know it was moving so fast. So it's all about recording light in all these old photographs. The dome's construction there began in 1857, and it's going to end in 1866. So it's going on throughout the entire length and breadth of the American Civil War. Uh, there's a bit of a metaphor there. The Capitol building is being constructed, and the United States is under construction as well. Well, politics has always been a bit of a contact sport in American history. However, in 1856, we're going to see uh, probably the most extreme thing that's ever happened on the floor and halls of Congress. There is a congressman from Massachusetts by the name of Charles Sumner. Now, Charles Sumner is an abolitionist, and there in 1856, he is going to insult... Uh, a senator by the name of Andrew Butler from South Carolina, as well as Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Uh, basically, he's going to call him every name in the book without cursing too harshly. Uh, th this is all related back to the notion of, of what's taking place in Kansas. Of course, this little event that takes place in Congress is going to wind up uh, being played out in the newspapers and, and talked about in all these different circles. And, uh, well, while Stephen Douglas is obviously not going to be very happy about Sumner's uh, insults there. Uh, a relative of Andrew Butler of South Carolina is going to take it to a completely different level. There's Preston Brooks uh, is a representative there in the House of Representatives. Preston Brooks, a close relative of the South Carolina senator, is going to walk into the, into the Senate chamber where Charles Sumner is working at his desk. Um, a few words are going to be exchanged, but then, according to those who are witnessing it, Preston Brooks then proceeds to brandish a cane and will brutally assault Sumner. Now, so Sumner gets knocked down and is trapped underneath a heavy desk which was bolted to the floor. Uh, his chair, which had been pulled up to his desk, moved back and forth on a track. Sumner either could not or did not think to slide his chair back to escape, so it pinned him under his desk. Brooks continued to strike Sumner until Sumner rose to his feet and ripped the desk from the floor in an effort to get away from Brooks. By this time, Sumner was blinded by his own blood. He staggered up the aisle and arms outstretched, vainly attempted to defend himself. But then, he was an even larger and easier target for Brooks, who continued to beat him across the head, face, and shoulders to the full extent of my power. Brooks did not stop... Brooks didn't stop when his cane snapped, and he continued thrashing Sumner with the piece which held the gold head. Sumner stumbled and reeled convulsion. Oh, Lord, he gasped. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Near the end of the attack, Sumner collapsed unconscious, although shortly before he succumbed, bellowed like a calf, according to Brooks. Brooks grabbed the falling Sumner, held him up by the lapel with one hand, and continued to lash at him with the cane in the other. Several other senators and representatives attempted to help Sumner, but were blocked by Edmondson, who yelled at the spectators to leave Brooks and Sumner alone, and Kite, who brandished his own cane and pistol and shouted, Let them be! Let them alone! As this, this fighting's going on, you know, the senators are bringing up the issue of, of honor and, and whether or not they should intervene, and if this is a fight between Brooks and Sumner, then, you know, let them bash it out. Well, everybody can plainly see that Charles Sumner is... is getting brutalized here if there's any point that Preston Brooks wanted to make about his honor I mean it, it's now it's 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 practically uh, attempted murder by this point well eventually they're going to restrain Brooks and he is going to quietly leave the chamber according to those that were there Brooks is going to return to the House of Representatives in the summer of 1856 uh, however karma does play uh, a little bit of a uh, a role in this uh, he's going to die of croup, which is basically a respiratory infection, uh, before the new term can begin there for the, the, the House of Representatives. So, uh, and, you know, Charles Sumner barely survived. Uh, he's going to live with, you know, he's going to live until the 1870s. Uh, he's going to serve Massachusetts in the Senate during the Civil War, uh, but he'll obviously never really be the same. 
So we have what amounts, at the very least, to assault and battery, and at the very worst, attempted murder, taking place on the floor of the U.S. Senate between Southern and Northern uh, representatives and senators. Well, at the heart of the whole matter, and I don't want to engage in any internet debate hijinks with anybody over this, um, the Civil War was a direct result of slavery and the way it was practiced in the North and the South. Uh, there are so many things, though, that come out with you know, the issue of tariffs and nullification and, and what South Carolina had threatened to do multiple times there during the administration of Andrew Jackson. It, it sort of becomes this issue where, you know, slavery is, is becoming more and more widespread. The number of Americans living in slavery, uh, somewhere around 4 million here at the start of 1860. So the number of slaves are growing. Uh, the idea that the South is getting all sorts of influence as they expand. Uh, the issue that, you know, it started, uh, you know, we, we have a shooting war taking place out there in Kansas on the prairies. And so now the issue of slavery is going to play out in the third branch of American government, the judicial system. Now you remember the judicial branch's job is to decide whether or not a law is constitutional. Well, they're going to get this opportunity in 1857 which would, with what becomes known as the Dred Scott decision. Uh, Dred Scott was a slave from Missouri uh, whose status as a free person was in question. Uh, Dred Scott had lived in the free state of Illinois. Uh, they'd also moved around. He'd, he'd been sold to an army officer. Uh, they'd lived in northern states uh, for many, many years. And so as the 1850s you know, proceed on, Dred Scott is going to... Um, attempt to sue his master. Uh, the case is going to get all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's going to occur... Um, actually, the decision doesn't take place in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Dred Scott case is made right here in St. Louis. In downtown St. Louis, uh, you've got the old uh, federal courthouse. The Dred Scott decision is going to be considered by most... Uh, to be the worst decision that the Supreme Court of the United States has ever made. The Supreme Court decision basically says that slaves have absolutely no legal rights, that they're not citizens, uh, that the, the issue of them, you know, the, the nature of them even being human beings is called into question. Uh, it's basically like we've written the Bill of Rights, uh, but we've excluded African Americans, you know, completely out of the picture. Uh, there's a strong belief here that Buchanan had advised the Supreme Court to resolve the matter before he began his presidential term. When the Supreme Court makes their decision against Dred Scott's freedom, uh, it basically puts people on one side of the fence or the other. And to add to the list of bad things happening in 1857, there's an economic panic that's going to hit. Um, people are going to lose investments. Business is going to slow down. So you've got a lot of economic anxiety uh, there as well. Uh, the Democrats are starting to split up into northern and southern factions. And then Buchanan is just going to blunder into uh, the Kansas crisis even more. Well, Stephen Douglas is going to be running for re-election as a senator from the great state of Illinois in 1858. Now, Douglas is a northern Democrat, and he's trying to make his voters happy. Uh, he's trying to appease them. He's trying to get them what they, give them what they want. And he's also playing into a lot of these suspicions that white voters have about abolitionists. Uh, however, on the flip side of that, uh, they're fearful of the South's growing power as well. Well, Abraham Lincoln is going to use the 1858 election as an opportunity to run as the Republican candidate, so that new political party there that's gaining momentum in the North. So Lincoln had won some big cases for some big clients and had actually gotten into a little bit of money there, and he's a, a, a popular rising star. According to the story, Douglas didn't want to debate Lincoln directly. However, um, on the outskirts of Monticello, just south of town there along Route 105, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, challenged Stephen Douglas uh, to a debate there on a hot summer day, on July 29th, 1858. Um, and then, of course, according to the, the tale, 
the two men will then travel to Bryant Cottage there in Bement, where they will agree upon the terms of the debate. These are going to be seven debates that take place all around Illinois, and the debates are going to be well attended. Uh, both men are quick-witted, they're knowledgeable, they're good public speakers, and the issue of Kansas is the talk of the day. Douglas is going to try to defend himself on the issue of popular sovereignty. He's going to try to work his hardest to paint Lincoln as an abolitionist. Lincoln is rather brilliantly going to lure Stephen Douglas into uh, looking weak on standing against the expansion of slavery. The Lincoln-Douglas debate is going to be published in newspapers around the country. In fact, it's going to make Abraham Lincoln a nationally known figure. Uh, Lincoln is going to be seen as uh, a sort of a voice of reason uh, by the people that are frustrated with the South's growing power, that aren't comfortable with the, the you know morality of slavery. And Lincoln is going to say some pretty strong words against slavery. It's going to be a very close election for Senate there in Illinois. Stephen Douglas is only going to win uh, the election there by 3,402 votes over Lincoln. Uh, so the debate has made Abraham Lincoln a nationally known politician. And all the while, Bleeding Kansas is still taking place. Uh, John Brown, who had been out there in Kansas... Uh, fighting against these people called border ruffians, uh, pro-slavery factions from Missouri. Fighting against anti-slavery forces out there in Kansas had made John Brown pretty radical. Uh, he has this idea in the fall of 1859 that today, you know, we have to kind of think about it, it would, it would be borderline terrorism. Uh, it would be seen by many as an act of uh, treason and rebellion, and he's a he's a remember he's a anti slavery um, anti slavery person here. John Brown has this idea to raid the U.S. Army arsenal in Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia, there along the Potomac River. Uh, so the purpose of this was to gain access to arms and ammunition to help start a slave rebellion all throughout the South. Uh, so this raid that takes place on the American arsenal there in Harper's Ferry, it's basically over before it begins. Uh, John Brown is going to be rather inept. Uh, the response that he's going to get from the army is going to be pretty fierce. Uh, this whole event basically ends where John Brown and his men are surrounded. Um, they're going to be found guilty and they are going to be executed for treason. Uh, ironically, the officer that was in charge of the U.S. forces sent to arrest John Brown uh, were led by a guy named Robert E. Lee. This caption here is sometimes mislabeled in a lot of books as being a photograph of Confederate soldiers on their way to go fight in the Battle of Bull Run. But more than likely, these guys belong to a militia called the Richmond Grays. Uh, these guys would have been under the command of Robert E. Lee there at the Harper's Ferry incident in 1859. As you can see, they're sort of bundled up with the cold weather. They wouldn't be wearing that type of clothing uh, in July there when, eight, when the Battle of Bull Run took place. So John Brown is going to be found guilty of treason, and he is going to be executed. Uh, John Brown is going to be hated in the South. This is going to be seen as a prime example of the extremism of abolition. Uh, to many people in the North, uh, I'd say the vast majority would not be uh, fans of John Brown. However, to the abolitionists and to many people who see slavery as a repugnant and immoral thing, uh, John Brown is going to be seen as a martyr. Remember, a martyr is somebody who dies for a cause. All the while, uh, Abraham Lincoln is going to rise to leadership in the Republican Party. Um, what ends up taking place is that uh, the Republicans are going to grow in number here for the 1860 presidential election. Uh, this is this built. This is a building in Chicago called the Wigwam. Uh, it was nicknamed that. It was built entirely out of wood. But basically, the uh, I think the way to kind of imagine what this building would have been like. Uh, it's it's kind of like a, a basketball court, sort of like a gymnasium. There's been a big hall in here uh, where the Republican Party is going to meet for their political convention in 1860. And it's going to be there that Abraham Lincoln is nominated to run for political office for the Republicans. For his running mate, Abraham Lincoln is going to choose Hannibal Hamlin from Maine as his vice president. 
you can see the themes that Lincoln and the Republicans are running on. The union must and shall be preserved. Free speech, free homes, free territory, and then the protection to American industry. So kind of seeing all the things that make the North the North there. Uh, so Abraham Lincoln is going to be running for president. We see him in front of his house there in Springfield, Illinois, likely the figure uh, standing there probably on a platform, head and shoulders over everyone else. And to make this whole situation even more dramatic, Stephen Douglas is going to be running for president for the Northern Democrats. And the newspapers call this the undecided political prize fight. Two candidates from Illinois uh, look like they're up for haggering it out again. Uh, lots of, you know, the issue of Kansas is seen played out here again and again. Liberty, the fair maid of Kansas in the hands of the border ruffians. And so we see these uh, Southerners there, these pro-slavery guys tormenting uh, Lady Liberty out on the plains and prairies of Kansas. The election of 1860 is, is going to be one of the oddest presidential elections in the history of the United States. I mean, you could see there Lincoln of the Republican Party uh, winning you know, the vast majority of the votes in the North, all those electors there. You're going to have Douglas only carrying Missouri, uh, while you have you have Bell, who is part of the Constitutional Union Party, uh, winning Virginia and, and the border states there of uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. But the Southern and pro-slavery candidate Breckinridge is going to win votes clear across the South. So Abraham Lincoln winds up winning the electoral votes there in the election of 1860. And those, you know, our presidential elections happen in November. Well, by December, uh, South Carolina has decided to do what they've always what they've always threatened, and that is to leave the Union. So after South Carolina uh, disbands themselves from the Union, they're going to be joined by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. When these states leave the Union, we call this secession, and secession is going to be seen by many as anarchy. In fact, President Buchanan is going to speak out against it, uh, but there's very little that he does during this time period. In fact, this is where he sort of gets that, you know, that, that reputation of him being the worst president in American history gets you know, further solidified by the indecision that he has during this time. Uh, but Abraham Lincoln is going to get on a train here in Springfield, Illinois, February 11th, 1861, and that train is going to take him east. A little bit of railroad history. Abraham Lincoln is going to ride through uh, Decatur on the Wabash Railroad, and that is going to take him uh, east of town through Saragordo and Bement, and eventually he's going to get uh, over the Illinois Central tracks there in Tolono, Illinois, and according to uh, the records there, Abraham Lincoln is going to step down from the train and give a speech, uh, give a short speech to uh, the residents of Tolono while his train is being refilled with water and coal. And uh, this will be the last time that Abraham Lincoln's feet will touch Illinois soil as a living man. Uh, the train's going to go all the way to Indianapolis on that day. And so you kind of have to think, what I, what I find fascinating is that in Abraham Lincoln's lifetime, so he's born in 1809, uh, you know, his family had basically walked from Kentucky to Indiana and then to Illinois. Um, but by the 1830s and 40s, this new technology of the railroads is turning you know, trips that would have taken a week or two into something that you can cover in a day. Um, Abraham Lincoln's train trip um, out to Washington, D.C. is going to be uh, about an 11-day ordeal uh, where he's going to give speeches in various places. He's going to sneak into Washington, D.C. because of assassination threats, uh, and he's going to be sworn into office there on March 4th, 1861. Uh, in this speech, Lincoln is going to denounce secession as anarchy, as chaos, uh, and he's going to explain that majority rule had to be balanced by the constitutional restraints in the American system of republicanism. And he also gives an impassioned plea to the South. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. <laughs>